Hello everyone, I'm Helen Cole and I'm delighted to be joining you um, on the occasion of your 80th birthday celebration. So congratulations to the Jane Austen Society for reaching that age. Um, it would be a great pleasure to be talking to you about either Jane Austen or illustration. So to be talking about both is a double pleasure. Um, thank you for in inviting me to the party. Um, this is really a lockdown talk because I'm going to be talking about some material that I have to hand um, and I'll explain in a minute. The title is Jane Austen in the Attic, Rediscovering the Illustrated Novels. Um, I also am very grateful for the chance to reconnect with Chawton House Library because even though it's a digital reconnection, um, it brings back happy memories. Um, I live about half an hour's drive from Chawton, 20 minutes really, but there are usually a few tractors in the way. Um, and just over a decade ago, I did most of my doctoral research at Chawton House. Um, I was given freedom to roam as long as I wanted to in the cellar storeroom, looking at the rare books collection there and poring over the illustrations in them. Um, it was a really immersive experience and sometimes I'd come upstairs from the basement and I'd find that um, while I'd been down there darkness had fallen or the weather had completely changed. On one occasion there'd been a snowstorm while I'd been down there and it really felt like going to the cinema and um, losing your sense of time and coming out and being surprised by real life still going on outside. So I have really happy memories of Chawton House and um, like everyone else, I expect I can't wait to be able to go back there in person. Um, the material for my talk today has really um, come from the fact that we are in lockdown because I was teaching a course on Jane Austen um, and I had saved a session on illustration till the end. Um, by the time we got there, COVID had happened and lockdown had happened. So my plan of taking the students on that course to Chawton House to look at some um, Jane Austen first editions and to look at some illustrated Austen editions um, from later in the 1800s, that all had to go on hold. Um, and so I was scratching my head a little bit, uh, thinking of material to show them um, in my online teaching, because actually a lot of my own um, digital images on my database at home are from an earlier period. So um, because Jane Austen's uh, novels weren't illustrated in her lifetime, um, we have to look to the late in, later 1800s to find illustrated editions of her work. And um, I realised I didn't have anything much to hand. And then, like a lot of people over the lockdown period, um, there's been a certain amount of clearing out going on at home. <laughs> and uh, my husband um, brought down some boxes and um, opened them up for me one day and inside those boxes are um, a lot of family material, archival material from his family, um, which I knew we had but I didn't really know what was in there. There's lots of textiles um, wrapped in yellowing paper and um, albums of faded daguerreotypes and letters and diaries. It all needs careful looking through one day. Um, I didn't know there were books in there and I didn't know what the books were. Um, and when we realised what we had there, I thought we could make uh, an interesting sort of um, celebration of uh, the time period that these novels come from. So I'm going to be talking about um, a series of editions that were produced in the 1890s and through into the early years of the 1900s, um, mostly published by Macmillan in London, but not entirely. So there were other publishers doing a similar thing. And in that uh, period, there was a real fashion for um, Christmas books. So not not books about Christmas, but books um, that were produced in November or December for the Christmas market. Um, and they mostly um, reproduced what would, would have been considered classic fiction by that period. So they were sure winners on the commercial market and the publishers could risk um, producing these books very beautifully 
and um, could pay out the fees for illustrating the books in particular. So they're of great interest to me. And I wanted to celebrate those with you today, the books that I found in my attic, and just walk you through what they look like on the outside and the inside um, by way of sharing them with you. So I'm going to use some slides to do that. Hopefully I can bring them alive. Um, this is what um, some of the books from our little collection at home look like. Um, it turned out that we have nine novels of this sort. They're not a set, um, and in particular, they're not all by Jane Austen. Of course, we wouldn't have nine novels, but um, they are a mixture, but they all have a real family similarity in the way they appear. Um, you can see that the one on the front of the pile there is Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. And um, that was published in 1891 in this very beautiful format. And because it was a great success, um, Macmillan and other publishers churned out more of the same. Um, churned isn't the wrong word to use, actually, because they must have been quite time consuming to produce. But a, a whole stream of these novels is called Cranford novels, or Cranford series, um, after that first successful one. Um, just to contrast the way those books looked with the way um, a Regency novel would have looked um, in Jane Austen's day or very soon thereafter. This is Chawton House's first edition of Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, um, published by John Murray in 1818. And back then, books would have been um, bound according to the owner's um, preference. So. Um, these are particularly fine bindings, and that, that is mottled calf um, binding there with a modern archival box in the background. So in the Regency period, you, the books would have mostly looked brown, but with these beautiful um, embossed decorations. In fact, when I go into a rare books shop today, I don't usually have much to spend, but um, if I go into a, a secondhand bookshop, I, I know to ask for brown crumblies <laughs> so they can show me the, the books of the period I'm looking for. Um, and that's the trade term for them, brown crumblies. It's one, rather wonderful. So that's very different, uh, very contrasting to the way that my 1890s editions look. Um, they are mostly in um, either green or red bindings, and they're gorgeous colours even now. They must have been jewel bright back when they were first produced. Um, and it does make me think um, that they look festive, which of course is appropriate because of the Christmas uh, gift idea. Um, and they're absolutely covered in gold decoration and the, um, the edges of the pages, um, the text block, uh, also are gilded, so it's very beautiful. Um, I can't help noticing that on the front of this one, for instance, um, which is my, my my edition of Emma from 1898, we have the um, name of the illustrator quite prominent there, but no mention of Jane Austen on the, on the cover, which is an interesting um, indication of what was important about the uh, the salesmanship of this book. Um, Jane Austen is, I must say, mentioned on the spine, thank goodness, but not on, but not on the cover. Um, so they're very beautiful and, and they make for a very festive, festive look. Um, the ones that I have are not, as I say, all by Jane Austen. And this is a beautiful example of um, a 1903 edition of Evelina by Frances Burney, um, one of the authors that Jane Austen particularly liked reading and uh, her influence is discernible in Jane Austen's own writing. Um, so an incredibly elaborate embossed cloth cover. These were cloth rather than leather. Um, and I think the uh, when um, this cover was designed, it must have been inspired by the portrait of Frances Burney, a famous portrait um, by her cousin, um, Edward Francisco Burney, uh, for which she really did not want to sit. And I think you can tell in her attitude and expression. Um, so it's in some nice interplay there between the design of the cover and that famous portrait. But this is the one that you probably know and love. Um, it's so famous even now. Um, the Pride and Prejudice edition um, is called the Peacock edition. And this is where I first want to mention the illustrator who I want to pick out today, Hugh Thompson. Um, he was active in the 1890s and 
um, almost all of the nine books that I discovered in my attic are illustrated by him. Um, that cover design is just iconic. I think that's an overused word, but it's probably fair enough here. Um, I wasn't surprised to find that you can buy a Pride and Prejudice peacock design cover uh, for a cushion. Um, but perhaps I was a bit design, uh, surprised to find that you can also buy a Pride and Prejudice peacock design shower curtain, which is what the smaller picture shows. I don't know if you can see a, a bath peeping out behind that blue square, but that's exactly, that's the magnificent Pride and Prejudice shower curtain. Um, looking at my edition of Emma, which was a few years later, so uh, the Peacock edition I have is um, 1894, and this is my edition of Emma, which is um, 1898. The inside of the book continues that theme, interestingly. Um, I mean, we normally assume, I think, probably rightly, that the Peacock design for Pride and Prejudice links to the idea of the peacock as a symbol of pride and vanity, which seems particularly appropriate for Pride and Prejudice. But here that motif is continued in Emma um, in a rather beautiful mustard colour, if you like mustard. And uh, um, it's uh, repeated on the flyleaf and the front paste down there. I've just highlighted a little detail, um, which is starting to bring alive for me the very personal nature of this little batch of books. Um, this is um, this belonged to my husband's grandfather, and we can see that he bought this book, or it was bought for him rather, um, at uh, Whiteley's Stationers in Westbourne Grove in London. And it's rather a period label as well, which is, is great to see. Everything about these books from the 1890s is very beautiful, very thought through. The design is carried through, and um, even the colophon or the publisher's mark, um, which appears a few pages in from the front cover, um, I just think the design is exquisite. That's Macmillan, um, the London publisher's uh, mark, so double M there, and I find that really exquisite. Um, this is the colophon or pub publisher's mark for George Allen, uh, so one of my nine books. I say mine, they're my husband's really, but I gather that what's what's his is mine, so <laughs> fair enough. Um, so one of them is published by George Allen, and that is their printer's publisher's mark. Um, again, very much of the period. Um, this just shows you that um, at the front of the book, um, immediately after the first illustration, which is the frontispiece, um, you have this rather lovely sheet of tissue paper. Um, and I think originally the idea of that was probably to protect the title page from um, getting a sort of ghostly imprint from the illustration when the book was closed and the, praise, the pages pressed together. So the tissue paper is there in theory as a sort of protection, but in reality it wasn't needed. So it's not very functional and it's more of an um, indication that this is an elaborate and beautiful book that's intended to be um, a keepsake. Um, because they're family books, I, I can't help being fascinated by the inscriptions. Um, my husband's family um, was quite an ordinary family, but they had access to education going back hundreds of years. And so they've left a lot of material. Um, they've left their voices behind, really. Um, and they certainly never missed an opportunity to write in their books. Um, and as a book historian, I've learned to be really, really grateful for that, um, because you can tell a great deal from those inscriptions. Um, I can, because my husband also has a carefully uh, put together family tree that was uh, compiled several generations ago, I can work out who's giving what to whom, which is also very nice. So um, this is a typical um, present from a, an, an aunt to a niece here. Um, and it bears out that it, it was indeed given at Christmas time. Um, likewise, this one um, given to um, one of the women of the family, um, Christmas 1898, and then passed on to my husband's mother, Susan Nicholson, um, much more recently. So and I didn't know she had a book plate, actually. It doesn't surprise me, but um, uh, Laura Nicholson uh, clearly clearly liked pugs. Um, 
And finally, another Christmas inscription. So just bearing out that idea of the Christmas gift. This was given to my husband's grandfather, Walter Nichol Nicholson, but he was called Nick, Nick Nicholson, um, with a rather wonderful book plate that he's pasted into the book. Um, book plates are great for book historians as well, because they can tend to tell us, um, for instance, that a book that might be thought scurrilous or uh, as many novels were described ephemeral at the time, we find these rather beautiful book plates in them, suggesting that they were treasured and considered important and not a matter for shame. So um, book plates are always good, good material to work with. Um, this is also a, a book plate from one of these nine books that we have. And I just wanted to sort of say that I made the mistake of assuming this was a uh, a woman's book or a book belonging to a woman because I thought that book plate was a woman's book plate but it's not. L.D. Nicholson, if I look back on the family tree, um, that's a man called Lothian Nicholson but it's very beautiful and again very much of its time that, that design I think. Um, so a little bit about the illustrator Hugh Thompson. Um, born in Ireland and destined for a career in business but um, he instead showed a great talent for drawing, self-taught completely, and um, you might think it was a lucky escape, I don't know, but he, he, he got away from business and um, went to become a draftsman and was recommended to go to London. So he did, and he worked on an important magazine in London, and he then um, was picked up by Macmillan as one of their house illustrators. Um, and something about his style spoke to the period. I think he he, he never really um, took on board influences from other people. He just had his own style from the start and he stuck to it. Um, and it was commercially very, very successful. This is probably a classic um, Thompson illustration. This one from Pride and Prejudice captioned reading Jane's letters. and. Perhaps this indicates some of the things that um, that have been criticisms that have been made, really, of um, Thompson. I mean, he's tended to be classed as um, lightweight, and it tends to have been said over the over the decades that he prettified Jane Austen. And I do take that point. And at first, when I saw the illustrations, I think I perhaps thought that as well, because they tend to accent um, the gently comedic aspects of Jane Austen and um, often the sociable aspects of Jane Austen. Not so much here because this is a solitary figure, um, but very often Thompson chooses to depict groups of people um, and he does like to do comic things. So there's a feeling out there that he he has somehow um, made Jane Austen less of a serious author. Um, I wanted to just show you a few of his illustrations and um, perhaps just query that judgment. Um, but this is another in his typical vein, if you like, um, from um, Northanger Abbey. Uh, and this shows Gen General Tilney um, getting annoyed when his daughter and Catherine Morland are late down for dinner. Uh, it's perhaps one of the first moments that you begin to think that General Tilney has a temper and it's quite nicely done there. Um, but still with that, it's not unduly menacing and I, I suppose I can't pretend that Hugh Thomas Hugh Thompson ever seriously does uh, distressing images, but he can capture a slight edginess and I just wanted to explore that. Um, this is perhaps the most famous illustration um, from Pride and Prejudice. It, it's reproduced quite widely and it's um, a headpiece that comes above the beginning of a chapter, chapter 15. Um, it's very striking. It sets out the five Bennett daughters um, arranged a sieve for inspection with a sign behind them saying not for sale. So quite a trenchant comment, really, on the marriage market uh, in the Regency period. Um, and on the left there, you have um, their mother, Mrs. Bennet, uh, fussily arranging the girls to best advantage. And on the right, um, interestingly, I was reading a very good book by a, a modern day critic um, who assumes that this is 
the girl's father, Mr. Bennett, on the right. Um, actually, I disagree with that. Um, I, I'll tell you why. I'll show you in the next slide. I think that was more obvious. I'm sure that it's Mr. Collins um, who is inspecting the girls for uh, as, as if they're in a shop, really. Um, it, it's I find that quite disturbing. And it, to me, I think Hugh Thompson slips these things in occasionally, these kind of qu quite um, unsettling comments on the manners of the time that he's depicting. Um, I think we can see that this surely is Mr. Collins here. There's a facial resemblance between the figure standing at the right of the group at the top and the um, figure in the decorated capital, um, the capital M there. Um, and that is a, a hot air balloon. It's not explained why Mr. Collins is depicted as a hot air balloon, but I think we can guess that um, it's because Mr. Collins is full of hot air. So, um, so typical piece of Hugh Thompson um, drollery, really. Can I show you this illustration next, um, which is captioned the three villains in horsemen's greatcoats. Um, this is from Northanger Abbey. And when I looked at this, I thought, I really don't remember what this comes from in Northanger Abbey. Where in the text is there an abduction uh, of a young woman, defenceless, uh, by a group of ruffians and a particularly dastardly fellow in the background, um, sort of sniggering into his coat sleeve? Um, I'm going to have to turn to the text to explain to you um, where indeed that comes. Well, in the novel, Catherine Morland is at the assembly rooms enjoying an evening with Henry Tilney and his sister Eleanor. And um, she knows that Henry's elder brother, Captain Tilney, is going to arrive shortly. Um, she's looking out for him with interest to see what he's like. Um, and this is what the narrator says. Um, Catherine Tilney, uh, Captain Tilney arrives and uh, Catherine looks at him with great admiration. His admiration of her was not of a very dangerous kind, not likely to produce animosities between the brothers, nor persecutions to the lady. He cannot be the instigator of the three villains in horsemen's greatcoats, by whom she will hereafter be forced into a chaise, a travelling chaise and four, which will drive off with incredible speed. Catherine, meanwhile, undisturbed by presentiments of such an evil, or any evil at all, enjoyed her usual happiness. It's a really quirky, curious moment in um, in Austen's narration uh, when she enjoys imagining a scene that isn't going to happen uh, and doesn't even cross her heroine's mind. Um, so it's an unusual time when the narrator breaks into our train of thought and imagines something that is very uh, gothic and um, extreme and uh, ridiculous, really, and a, a trope from earlier fiction, um, sort of foreshadowing uh, Catherine's own uh, imagination running away with her later on in the novel. Um, I just find it fascinating that Hugh Thompson chose to pick up that almost throwaway line and illustrate that rather than going for the easier or more op obvious option of uh, illustrating the dancing or the feasting at the assembly rooms. So just an interesting choice and I find he does this quite often if I look carefully. Um, I won't tell you very much about this one because it's difficult to um, explain without reading out a large chunk of text, but this also is from Northanger Abbey. And again, you might look at that and think, well, I don't remember there being a battle scene in Northanger Abbey. Uh, and indeed there isn't, but this is a moment of flight of fancy by Henry Tilney in, in the course of some very fast paced, witty repartee with um, Catherine and Henry's sister, Eleanor. And it's just a moment when he, he just makes an off the cuff reference to um, the outcome of a riot in London. And uh, that's what Thompson's chosen to illustrate. Uh, instead of the three figures um, walking up a, a hill outside Bath to look at the view, he's chosen uh, to illustrate Henry Tilney's moment of imagination, which I find quite interesting. And the horses are very beautifully drawn um, and the terror is very real in, in the horses. So it's 
when you first look at it, quite a convincing battle scene. It's only when you look at the figures in the background that they become slightly comedic. And then finally, another moment where uh, Hugh Thompson does the unexpected, this time from Emma. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from the um, from the text, but the, the slide there um, shows the caption, um, which is showing your picture to his mother and sisters. This is um, quite early on in the novel, Emma, when Emma is very committed to the project of um, bringing about a match between Harriet Smith and Mr Elton. Um, Harriet, meanwhile, has been sadly thinking about the scene at the, the Martin household, where at that precise moment they probably are opening the letter in which Harriet has rejected Robert Martin's proposal of marriage. Um, so Emma's mission is to distract Harriet as quickly as possible and get her onto the subject of Mr Elton. Uh, so Emma says, let, let us think of those among our absent friends who are more cheerfully employed. At this moment, perhaps, Mr Elton is showing your picture to his mother and sisters, telling how much more beautiful is the original. And after being asked for it five or six times, allowing them to hear your name, your own dear name. Harriet, being Harriet, says, my picture? But he's left my picture to be framed in Bond Street. Has he so, says Emma. Then I know nothing of Mr Elton. No, the picture is his companion all this evening, his solace, his delight. It opens his designs to his family. It introduces you among them. It diffuses through the party those pleasantest feelings of our nature, eager curiosity and warm prepossession. How cheerful, how suspicious, how busy their imaginations all are. It is a very vivid imagination by Emma, um, but it's completely fictitious, even within the novel. So, um, so yes, again, Hugh Thompson has chosen to illustrate something quite oblique, really. Um, it, it's here we have Jane Austen um, imagining her heroine's thoughts, in which that heroine imagines a scene, which is in turn reimagined by Thompson. It's complicated. But Thompson didn't always take the easy option, as I hope I've shown. Um, he does often choose the obvious and he does it very beautifully, but he does like to bury the far less obvious uh, among the hundreds of illustrations that he produced in the 1890s. And many of the best loved of those are his illustrations for Austin novels. So I hope I've succeeded in um, suggesting that it might be worth looking at Thompson's illustrations with an open mind. Um, it's possibly worth looking in your attic as well, <laughs> or you possibly already have these books on your bookshelves, but many of these 1890s novels did survive. Um, some 25,000 copies of Pride and Prejudice, it's believed, were, believed were sold uh, up to the period 1907, so lots of them may still be out there. It's always worth checking. Um, I hope I've also um, suggested or, or encouraged us all to feel that it's worth going back to um, Chawton House just as soon as we can to look at these novels um, in the collection at uh, Chawton and to look at the original um, earlier, the first editions and so on that they have in the amazing collection there. I really hope it won't be too long before we can all dare do that. And in the meantime, um, I also really hope you enjoy this 80th birthday celebration. And thank you once again for um, inviting me to be part of it.